This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Now, it's a very great pleasure indeed and privilege to us to have Dr. Mary Leakey with us this afternoon. She's not a particularly easy person to persuade to give a public lecture, for her work keeps her more than fully occupied now at Alderway Gorge. And anyone who has been there, I think, has seen something of the work that she's doing will appreciate On today's the episode, the second to last in our From the Archive series, I'm thrilled to share a never-before-released lecture by Mary Leakey from the Leakey Foundation Archive. It's about the place she called home, the site of several of her revolutionary discoveries, Olduvai Gorge. Mary Leakey's been called the Grand Dame of Archaeology. She was an exacting and meticulous scientist who made some of the most significant archaeological finds in the world. The matriarch of the Leakey family, she was known to prefer digging in the dirt to presenting in lecture halls. She was also known for her no-nonsense attitude and her love of Dalmatians and strong tobacco. Sixty years ago, on July 17, 1959, Mary Leakey discovered a fossil that radically changed the world's understanding of human evolution, and it marked the beginning of modern paleoanthropology. It was a discovery that came after nearly 30 years of painstaking work at Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, where she and her husband, Louis Leakey, searched for fossil evidence of humanity's African origins. The day Mary made her discovery, Louis was sick with the flu, so he stayed in bed at their camp underneath the thorn trees. Mary, with her constant companions, her Dalmatians, Sally and Victoria, went to see what they could find at a nearby site at Olduvai, known as FLK, named by Lewis for his first wife, Frida. In her autobiography called Disclosing the Past, Mary Leakey wrote, One scrap of bone that caught and held my eye was not lying loose on the surface, but projecting from beneath. It seemed to be part of a skull. It had a hominid look, but the bone seemed enormously thick, too thick, surely. She carefully brushed away some dirt and saw two big hominid teeth sticking out of a jaw. She rushed back to camp and told Lewis, I've found him. I've found our man. Lewis leapt out of bed, miraculously feeling much better, and went to see what they'd been searching for for all those years. They named it Zinjanthropus boisei, after their financial sponsor, Charles Boise. It's now known as Australopithecus boisei. Mary and Lewis called it Dear Boy, or Zinge, and it later got the nickname Nutcracker Man due to its huge teeth that were roughly four times the size of modern human teeth. Dated to about 1.75 million years old, the Nutcracker Man captured the public imagination and made Mary and Lewis Leakey world famous. The story of how Mary Leakey ended up becoming the world's most famous female archaeologist is a fascinating one. She was born Mary Douglas Nicholl in 1913 in London, England. Her father was a renowned landscape artist, and after World War I, her family moved around Europe and spent time living in Switzerland, Italy, and France. Mary was extremely close with her father, and he took his daughter to visit Paleolithic cave art sites and archaeological digs in France. These childhood experiences sparked a lifelong passion for archaeology, driven by her intense curiosity about how early humans might have lived. In 1926, Mary's father died suddenly, and Mary, who had just turned 13, was devastated. She and her mother moved to London, where she was sent to school for the first time. It did not go well. Mary was a young woman with an independent, rebellious streak. And much to her mother's dismay, she was expelled from school twice, once for refusing to recite poetry, and finally, for purposely causing an explosion in her chemistry class. That was the end of her formal schooling, and she never finished high school. In 1930, at the age of 17, she started to audit archaeology classes at the University College London. She wrote letters to archaeologists asking to join their expeditions. She was offered a position with a woman named Dorothy Liddell, who was running a site in Devon, England. Mary worked with Liddell for three summers. She built up her skills and expertise in archaeology and scientific illustration. Then she went to work for another female archaeologist named Gertrude Catton, who in 1933 invited Mary to a dinner party, where she was seated next to Louis Leakey. 
By then, at the age of 20, Mary was already an accomplished archaeologist and illustrator. Lewis, impressed by her drawing skills, asked her to illustrate a book he was working on, and she said yes. Two years later, they set out together for Olduvai Gorge. They were an extraordinary team from the beginning. She was the organized, detail-oriented perfectionist. He was the exuberant visionary and spokesman. Starting in 1935, they worked together at various sites throughout Kenya and Tanzania, searching for the origins of humankind. They worked in often harsh conditions with little to no money. In the dry season at Olduvai Gorge, the nearest source of fresh water is a spring that's 18 miles away. Mary recalled a time when the only available water was from a nearby mud hole, which she said consisted of as much rhinoceros urine as drinkable water. But she had found her home and her life's calling. In 1948, Mary Leakey made her first big discovery on Rasinga Island in Kenya, an 18-million-year-old fossil ape they called Proconsul Africanus. It was an astounding find, but it wasn't until the discovery of the Nutcracker Man that the leaky name became synonymous with the study of human origins. Soon after that, in the early 60s, Mary and Lewis discovered another new species, Homo habilis, nicknamed the Handyman. After Lewis Leakey died in 1972, Mary continued to work and hunt for fossils, and in 1976, she made yet another extraordinary discovery at a site called Laitoli in Tanzania. It was a trail of fossilized hominin footprints preserved in volcanic ash that had blanketed the ground around 3.6 million years ago. When she finished excavating the footprints in 1978, she stood up from her work, lit a cigar, and announced, now this really is something to put on the mantelpiece. The Laitoli footprints were the first discovery of their kind in the history of science, and they sealed Mary Leakey's status as a legendary archeologist one who still steadfastly avoided the spotlight. That's why we're so lucky that she made an exception for the Leakey Foundation and regularly gave talks for our speaker series, including the one you'll hear today. Mary Leakey continued to work at Olduvai Gorge and elsewhere until she retired in 1983. She died in 1996 in Nairobi, Kenya. The complete list of her accomplishments is far too long to read here, but these are a few. She discovered 15 new species and one genus of animals. She was awarded four honorary degrees, including from Oxford and Yale. She was given the Gold Medal of the Society of Women Geographers, the Linnaeus Gold Medal of the Royal Swedish Academy, and she was the second woman to be awarded the Hubbard Medal of the National Geographic Society, which, together with the Leakey Foundation, helped to fund much of Mary Leakey's fieldwork. Here's Mary Leakey, recorded in San Francisco in 1973, at her Leakey Foundation lecture entitled The History and Meaning of Olduvai Gorge. The best thing for me to do, I think, is give you something of the history, discovery of the gorge, and the way Lewis and I have worked there and then go on to various excavations and the harmony discoveries and compare them briefly with those my son has made at East Rudolph, then the stone industries, and finally a few words about the prehistoric animals and the present day animals that are living in the same area. The gorge was found in 1911 by a German butterfly collector called Katwinkel, who was collecting butterflies on the Serengeti while Tanzania was German East Africa. He found the gorge quite accidentally, went down, explored it slightly, and found some bones of extinct three-toed horses, which he took back to Berlin where they excited tremendous interest, and the Germans sent out a, the first expedition in 1913, and they collected a vast amount of fossil material, no stone tools. In fact, they didn't believe that there were any stone implements at Aldervai. 
Then they were going to send another expedition in 1914, but the First, First World War intervened, and that came to nothing. Then Aldevay went into temporary oblivion until Lewis went over to Berlin and saw the collections made there by the Germans. That must have been about in 1928 or 1929, I'm not sure. And he arranged to go out 1931, 32, with the German geologist who'd been there previously, that is Professor Hans Reck. They went there in 1931 and 1932, and again, they found vast number of fossils, and Lewis found the first stone tools within a few hours of arriving at the gorge. He had, in fact, seen some in the museum in Berlin where they had been collected as um, geological specimens. But the fact that they were made by man had not been recognized. After that, I went, my first visit to Aldevay was in 1935, and we were there for about three months. Then there was no money, absolutely no money, to work it at all. Until in 1959, I found the skull of Zinjanthropus or Australopithecus boisei, which Lewis took to Washington and succeeded in interesting the National Geographic Society in a project for exploring Aldevay Gorge. And the society has supported the work ever since, and is still supporting it, come to that. And it is thanks to them that we have been able to make a planned excavation starting the lower beds and working up systematically to the higher levels, Stone Age cultures, hominid remains, and faunal remains. Now, um, excavation is still going on, but the first part of the sequence, the early beds have already been published, and I'm hoping now to get the latter part of the sequence also in print. Now, this is a photograph of the Aldevar area taken from a satellite from about 600 miles up. And um, that shows you the part of the gorge in the dry season. And it's very barren and very arid. That is the same area taken in the wet season. And you see what a vastly different place it is. It's, it's lush and green, and there are animals all over the place, and other parts of time of year, it's extremely dry and barren. Can we have the next, please? Again, this is springtime, and there are the thorn trees in blossom, and the basalt, the lava, that is underneath the lake sediments in the bottom of the riverbed, and that has been dated to 1.9, 1.89 million years. Next, please. Here again is a view of the gorge. You've got the basalt, the lava at the bottom. There, the black rock. Then you go up through bed one and bed two, and you get to bed three, I think, as far as I can see, and then up into bed four as well, the top. Next, please. Now, this is a, a diagram to show you the Stone Age cultures and the hominid remains as we have found them to date at Aldify. Now, in the Stone Age cultures, you have in bed one and into the bottom of bed two, you have the older one. And that is characterized by a fairly limited toolkit, but more than used to be thought. That goes on with a, an increased toolkit. They have more diversity in tools, and they get a bit more skillful in making the tools, and that goes on up through bed two. We found one site in bed three, but bed three is, is very poor in remains, and it goes right through up to the top of bed four, where it becomes a rather more evolved industry, but it does not have large hand axes and cleavers 
that you get in the Achelaire. Uh, the Achelaire we get first in middle bed two, at about 1.2, 1.3 million years. That's there. And it is one of the earliest known occurrences of the Handex culture. That goes on up, right through, right through into the Massac beds, where it is a very beautifully made industry. But, <coughs> I'll come back to this in a minute, it didn't evolve, apparently, along one nice, straight evolutionary line. There may have been different groups of people making this industry. Turning to the hominids, in bed one, you have the robust Australopithecus, Boisei or Zingentropus, who really got Aldivai going, got it on its feet, by interesting the National Geographic Society. <laughs> and uh, contemporary with Zinge, you have a small creature that's being called Homo habilis, and I shall continue to call it Homo habilis, although there are certain people, I think, here today who may not agree with me. However, Homo habilis it is, as far as I'm concerned. That was <laughs> contemporary with Zinge. And I'm convinced myself that was the tool maker, and Zinge was probably not. Zinge may not have been wholly upright, but although we know very little about his locomotion, but discoveries that my son Richard has made in East Rudolph have revealed a lot more of the skeleton, the hands and the feet, and in a few years we may know a great deal more than we do now. However, Cavalis is in bed one, in lower bed two, and then we don't get him any more at all. He just disappears. Australopithecus goes on to the top of bed two, and in upper bed two, through three, apparently, into four, you get Homo erectus, which you also get in Asia, or in the place, as you all know, the, the form of man with great big heavy brow ridges. But that is briefly the picture of the hominids and the Stone Age industries. You've got approximate dates on the left there. Um, we've had to push back the final, the end of the final the reversal, and that's now gone into four. Before that, we thought it was in three, but we've now got good evidence that it's as high as four. Now, people often ask, how do you find a site? How do you know where to dig? And it has been suggested that we, we just sink a hole 20, 30 feet, 40 feet, whatever you like, just at random. Well, now, you don't do that. You go along the side of the gorge, and you look, you crawl, you creep, you take it very slowly, and you watch where things are washing out by wind, rain, by any form of erosion. And if you find a place where a lot of material is coming out, you put in what's known as a trial trench, quite a narrow trench, into the side of the cliff. And if results are good, you extend that and perhaps turn it into a major excavation. Here you see Lewis and part of the family, I think myself actually, doing this exploration of the side of the gorge. Next, please. Here again, this is Richard, I think, when he was younger, climbing a cliff, holding a chopper or something, and it can be quite precipitous at times. Next, please. Now, this is the excavation at the site of Zingantropus while it was in progress. But we dug a vast area there, hoping to find the lower jaw of the skull, which we never did. But we found that very nice plan of a living site and very interesting stone tools. And what we did was to cut it up into segments and leave a central ridge down the middle of the excavation to give us a section into which we could tie the sections in the various cuttings. This is just a method of excavation. Next, please. Now, here we have um, skeleton 
of a dinosaurian, which is a, a relative of the elephants, not an elephant apparently, but a relative of the elephants, that had tusks in its lower jaw, downward curving tusks, not upward, but downward curving tusks in the lower jaw. It was interesting because it was clearly a carcass that early man had made use of. Whether he killed it himself or whether he found the skeleton, the, the carcass, and made use of it and cut the meat off, I don't know. But all around these bones, and actually within the stomach cavity, there were stone tools. Choppers and small cutting tools scattered all around the bones. So he may actually have, early man may have swamped this animal himself, because it was in very swampy materials, or he may have found it and made use of it. But he certainly had a hand in cutting it up. Uh, next, please. Now, here again, you have one of the excavations. This is a site um, in lower bed one, that's perhaps 1.8 million years, where, as far as I can see, there was a shelter built by early men. They were living down on the flats by the lake, and it must have been extremely windy and uncomfortable. And we found a circle of stones, which you see there, coming round here. Unfortunately, I destroyed that section of the circle when I excavated, because I had no idea I was likely to find a, a hut circle at that age. But as far as I can see, it was probably a rough shelter made of branches or boughs that was stuck into the ground, and in order to support the bases of the branches, they piled stones round the bottom, like these little heaps of stones you get. And it is, if it's true, and I think it is true, then it's certainly far and away the earliest structure, earliest man-made structure any in the world, anywhere in the world. Next, please. Now we come to the hominids. Uh, this is Zingentropus, Australopithecus boisei. The, the lower jaw is reconstructed. It was reconstructed before the East Rudolph finds were made, and I think this part here is much too deep. It shouldn't be like that. That part's wrong. But the actual skull is reconstructed, but there's very little room for error. Now that is the big, robust male Australopithecus. And Professor Dart is the father of all Australopithecines, as we know. <laughs> he was, we have this male at Aldify, but then we have Habilis. Next, please. Now there, I don't know whether you can see it, but there is a small skull of Habilis from the lowest part of bed one, the same level as the hut circle. And personally, I think it's probably a female because it seems more delicate and more fragile, and the teeth are smaller than the creature that was called a male. Um, some people would prefer to call this Australopithecus Habilis, but I think myself it was a tool maker, and I'm of the opinion that if you can prove or have fairly good proof that a hominid was a tool maker, I consider you're justified in calling it a man, because I don't think you'll ever find an anatomical threshold where you can say, this wasn't a man, this was a man. But this is purely a matter of, of personal opinion, and not everybody thinks likewise. At any rate, there's a small habilis. Next, please. Here you have the hominids, the principal hominids, from bed one at Aldify. On the left, at the bottom, you have, I don't know whether you can see, it's a bit dark, but that is Zingentropus. At the top, you have the habilis skull, as it was first found, absolutely squashed. And it was encased in a lump of limestone, 
And the man who stuck it together again had six months to get it out of the matrix and just about another six months to reassemble it. On the right, you have the lower jaw of the original Havilis that uh, gave rise to the creature being named. And below, you have hand bones that were found with that mandible and are probably associated. Below, you have two limb bones, very slender, small, that were found on the same floor as Syngantropus, but that seem much too slender and likely built to go with that creature there and probably go with Habilis, of which there were various skull fragments and teeth actually on the same level as the skull of Syngantropus. Next, please. Now, here you have the skull that has caused a great deal of disturbance. This is the one that was found last year, known as 1470. And it has a very much bigger brain capacity than any Australopithecus that's been found, or than Homo habilis, or any other prehistoric skull of that period. It's round about on the estimates now, the cranial capacity is about 800 cubic centimeters, whereas Syngantropus was, I think, 580, and most of the Australopithecines are between 4 and 500. So that this is very much bigger cranial capacity. It has a face that is reminiscent of Australopithecus. But the high vault, the thick uh, bone of the vault, and many respects seem to distinguish it from all the other fossil hominids of this time. And as far as the dating goes at the moment, this is placed at a nearly 3 million. That's 2.9 million years. But I think we must still regard the dating with some degree of caution, but this is what the physicists have assured Richard is the correct date. Next, please. Here you have one of the mandibles attributed to Homo from East Rudolph, and there are certainly two hominids there. There's the Australopithecus, male and female, and there is a Homo uh, might even be more than one, but there is certainly one, and this is from one of the slightly higher levels, not as early as the skull of 1470. Next, please. Now we turn to tools. Now, I showed you that diagram where you had the older one, the developed older one, and the Echelet. Now here you have part of an Ashland site where the tools are lying in place and all those things that you see lying around there have been fashioned by man. They're all, they've all been flaked. It's an extremely rich site and this happens to be an upper bed four. But uh, so many of the bed one sites are equally rich. Next please. Here you have typical tools of the older one. They're known as choppers, or chopping tools, and in effect they're just a rounded, water-worn stone that they picked up in a riverbed or wherever they happened to find one, and they flaked one edge roughly, very often from alternate directions, to get a jagged, sharp edge. And when those are fresh, they are really very effective tools. And the older one is characterized by these choppers. They can be made out of all sorts of different materials, and when they didn't have water-worn stones, they used lumps of quartzite, but when they could get a water-worn stone, they preferred it, because it was clearly much nicer to hold in the hand if you weren't going to haft it. Next, please. Here again, two more older one choppers just to show you the variety of types. 
Uh, but at the same time, at the same industry that they had these choppers, they also have a variety of small tools made on flakes for cutting and scraping and heaven knows what for. But they are associated with these choppers, although the choppers are the most obvious tools and for a long time were considered to be the only tools of the old one. Now here you have a chopper that Lewis made and he's showing how very sharp these things are when they're freshly made. Now, this I'm afraid is uh, not very serious, but <laughs> in 90, I think it was 1961 when Professor Dart and Professor Arenberg, Dr. Clark visited Aldify, we had an experiment and they made ch stone choppers on the spot and they then proceeded to cut up the leg of a cow, skin it, cut it up, and bash the bones and extract the marrow. And here you see Professor Dart sampling some of the marrow that was extracted from this experimental leg of a cow. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> now we're turning to the Ashulean. That's the hand axe culture. And here is a very big hand axe that, well, quite truly, it's difficult to know how that could have been held successfully unless it was hafted. And we really don't know how the hand axes were used. It's heavy, it weighs several pounds, the edge is sharp all the way around, and if you hold it, as I'm holding it there, where it is, you, and try to do anything with it, you certainly get your palm of your hand cut open. However, this is a type of tool that became worldwide in popularity. You get it all over Europe, well not all over, but in certain parts of Europe, Africa, Asia, and it caught on. Once it was invented, it caught on. They are characterized by a point at one end, a rounded butt, and a sharp edge, either all the way around or most of the way around. Now, as well as hand axes, the Ashleyan people had broad-ended axe-like tools that are known as cleavers, and this is one of them. And instead of coming to a point at the end, they had a transverse cutting edge. It has been suggested that these were used for skinning or flaying, but again, it's purely guesswork and nobody really knows what they were used for. Some of them are very large and others are quite small. The use on the edge can be all round or it can be on the end. So we really don't have any clues. And those are the two principal tools of the Ashulean people who also had a variety of small tools, but not to the extent that the Alduin people had during later times. Now, first of all, the developed older one, which was contemporary with the hand axe culture at Aldervai, had no reasonably well-made hand axes. They had what seemed to be rather poor copies of hand axes, made very unskillfully, and they were not capable of apparently knocking off the big flakes that the Ashleyan people used. But they had a big variety of small tools, far more than the Ashleyan people had. Small scrapers, chisels, borers, all sorts of things. And we really don't know why these two um, cultural elements went on side by side. And it's one of the subjects on which we disagree very violently, most of us. In fact, there are some people here who disagree with me very violently. But you can either say, if you like, that they're due to different environment or different activities or different people who had different traditions in tool making. And we really don't know, but the fact of the matter is that these two industrial traditions go on side by side at Alderweil from middle bed two upwards, which is a very long time, actually. Now, here you have another butchery site. You remember we saw the Dinotherium skeleton? Now, this is an elephant, Elephus reci. And this, again, was 
surrounded by stone tools, choppers, small cutting tools. And again, it was in a swampy deposit in the clay, and it either got engulfed in the clay accidentally and then butchered, or the early men drove it in. And we have got other instances of very big animals being embedded in apparently swampy deposits. And it is quite possible that this is one of the methods whereby early man butchered, slaughtered the very big animals that he couldn't kill by any other method. This, I'm turning to the fossil animals now, and I will then show you some of the present day animals that, whose forebears lived in the area in the prehistoric times, and uh, their present day descendants. Now this is a fossil hippopotamus skull, and that is a one foot ruler there, and it is quite twice as large as any present day hippopotamus. Now the hippopotamus, or hippopotami, at Aldivai, we get three kinds. In bed one, we get a thing that's been called hippopotamus, gorgops, to which this belongs and it's characterized by having these elevated eye sockets. So that it could submerge in the lake, just leaving its eyes above water level. Then in bed two, this type of hippopotamus disappears, and you get what appears to be an animal ancestral to the living hippopotamus, amphibious. Then as you go on up into bed four and upper two, you get a reappearance of this hippo, Gorgox. Now, nobody really understands what, what control the hippos. You also have a pygmy hippo in upper bed two, a really small animal, not much bigger than a small donkey. But he's a very rare creature indeed. Next, please. This is a sample of the Aldivai fauna in the Aldivai Museum. And probably the most interesting animal is that big creature in the middle there with curly horn cores. Now that was an antelope, a giant antelope. It was for a time called a sheep because of the size and because of the shape of its horns. But it is an antelope and it's known as Pelorovis. And that was a huge animal that lived in middle bed two times when a great number of the animals seem to become particularly large. We found that, we found it in various sites, but the main place where we found it, we found about a dozen skeletons, again engulfed in a swampy deposit and surrounded by stone tools. And again, it suggests that early man either drove them into the swamp or took advantage of the fact that they had got swamped there. Then you have this is an extinct giraffe known as Jume. It has a much flatter um, forehead and the horns go much back, much further than the present living giraffe. It's about the same size or possibly slightly larger. There was also a pygmy giraffe that for a time was thought to be an acarpi but it is now known to be a giraffe, although it was about the same size as a living okapi. Those are some of the fossil animals you saw. And now I'm going to show you a few of the animals that live on the Serengeti today and whose forebears we find as fossils. I pointed out the giraffe. These, of course, are the present-day giraffe that are not found as fossils although they must have ancestry somewhere, but the fossil giraffe of Aldivai are not the same as these. Next, please. Now you come to wildebeest. I showed you that very elegant fossil horn core, which you see is nothing like present-day creatures, but I th they were probably a common animal in the past, as they are now, although now they, they are migratory, come through the area once a year, this is during the migration when the wildebeest pour over the Serengeti and 
paw through the gorge, and those things that look like ants are, in fact, a herd of wildebeest. And I suspect myself that this migration is a form of survival and rotating the grazing in different areas, and I feel that it's very likely it was taking place as far back as the Pleistocene. It is a most remarkable site and a most remarkable feature, and of course the Serengeti is the only place left in Africa where it still takes place. Next, please. Um, you have, where the migration takes place, the uh, predators follow on, and here you have a wildebeest calf hanging in a tree where it's been stored by a leopard. The leopard follow the herds, the hyenas, the lions follow the herds, and the leopards kill far more creatures than they need to eat and store them in trees for rainy days. Next, please. This is another pachyderm, and of course you don't get any hippos. Nowadays, except for three remnants, in one of the lakes at the head of the gorge, but they never get more than three, and nobody quite knows what keeps the numbers down to that. But while the prehistoric lake was at Aldevai, there were immense numbers of hippos. And in bed four, they are one of the most common of all fossils. And I showed you that very large skull and told you there was a, a pygmy as well. This, of course, is the present day hippo. Next, please. Now we come to the predators. This is not a very evil one. This is a small genet cat, a viverid, a relative of a mongoose. And they are amongst the fossil animals at Aldify, and the fossil is not very far different from the living genet of today. Next, please. Hunting dogs wild dogs like Kaon. These are not found amongst the fossils, but there is a fossil canis, a fossil dog, that is much bigger than these creatures and is much closer to true dog, true canis in its dentition. But the fossils we have are very incomplete and we can't say very much about it. But these are not present amongst the fossils. Next, please. Hyenas that uh, nowadays turn into predators and in the past were responsible for, I imagine, for destroying more hominid remains than any other uh, element at Aldify because so many of the bones and skull fragments have tooth marks where they've been chewed. And I imagine these creatures went round and scavenged on all the living sites once they were abandoned. So we have destruction of hominid fossils to lay at the hyena's door, as well as many other things. Next, please. And finally, lionesses, who I, I'm sorry to say are decreasing nowadays. And the fossil lion from upper bed two is a strange animal. We have a complete lower jaw. And in the lower jaw, it's closer to a tiger, to an Indian tiger, than it is to a lion. Because a lion's jaw is convex on the lower board. So that if you put it on a, on a flat surface, you can rock it back and forward. But a tiger's jaw is, has a, an arch, a hollow in the middle, and both ends stand squarely on a flat surface. Well, now the fossil from Aldevai is closer to the tiger than it is the living lion, but of course, it doesn't mean it had stripes. Next. <laughs> and this is the last picture. That is my can, and it's just to show you that we live at close quarters at the game because the lions killed there the night before, and that's the vultures on the kill. Right, thank you very much. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit organization that funds human origins research and shares discoveries. This season of Origin Stories was made possible by support from Dixon Long, Camilla Smith, Jeannie Newman, and donors like you. 
Thanks so much to everyone who contributed to our quadruple match challenge. We're so grateful for your generous contributions. And thanks to your support, we've brought on an additional producer to help with all the exciting stories we're working on. And thanks to our challenge sponsor, the match is still available. So if you'd like to donate, you can support this show and the signs we talk about by giving to the Leaky Foundation today. And every donation will be quadrupled. So your $5 becomes $20, your $10 becomes $40, and if you gave $50, it would become $200 to support origin stories. Go to leakyfoundation.org slash origin stories challenge. It'll really help us, and we appreciate it so much. The link is in your show notes. Another way to help is to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, give us five stars, tell a friend, tweet about the show. It all helps people to find us, and it means a lot. This episode was produced by me, sound designed by Katie McMurrin. Our theme music is by Henry Nagel. We'll be back next month with the final episode of our From the Archive series, and then it's back to stories. We have some great ones in the works, and we can't wait to share them with you. Thanks for listening.